So our memory verse today, again, we're, we're talking about having fun, having fun. Uh, you see the kayaks, you see the oars, you see everything that we're going to be doing. Everything this year is about being propelled. If you have not seen it, we have our bracelets, and bracelets excuse me, on the back table near the entrance. So if you have not gotten a, a bracelet, please pick one up. If you have one and you would like to receive another one, grab one, give it to a friend. Uh, wear two or three. We have three different colors. We have a black, we have a red, we have a white. So feel free to grab a hold of that and, and um, minister the gospel. But the reason why this is important is because we, you, you got to make sure you use it as an evangelistic tool. Uh, you know what the verse says, you know what it means, and know what it means to you. Always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. So if you're going to use it as an evangelistic tool, use it. It's the same thing with a cross. You have a cross of gold, a Christian T-shirt. Do you know how to use it to evangelize the gospel? Make sure you know what it says and you, you're able to use it. Hey, what does that shirt mean to you? So my son is actually, uh, it's his first time ever, he's actually doing the object lesson. He's a fifth grader. He's doing the object lesson for the memory verse for Kids Church today. So we are practicing it. And so when, when he gave me an object, and his object was a, a soccer ball and a trophy, like, all right, that's awesome. What does it mean to you? I like playing soccer. Okay, 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 that's good. But then I started coaching him. I asked questions, and he started answering it. And then by the end of it, he had a whole object lesson, and they related it to, from that object to the verse. Uh, we got to be able to do that. So if you're wearing the bracelet, if you wear a T-shirt, if you wear anything like that, make sure you're ready to use it and, and spread the gospel. Amen? All right, so our memory verse this month not our memory verse on the, on, the, on the bracelet, but our memory verse this month is Proverbs 17, 22. Proverbs 17, 22, it says this. A merry heart is what? It does good. It's like medicine. But a broken spirit dries the bones. It weakens it. It makes you tired. Uh, a merry heart. Have fun this year. Have fun. Be excited. Lift, lift someone up. Uh, help someone out. And it, there's, there's a... There's an energy there that, that builds things up. When God is number one in your life, there's an energy source there that, that has a merry heart, and it's good like medicine, okay? So that's a great verse, having fun this, this month. I feel like a large part of having fun is celebrations. It's, it, it's, it's all about having fun and, 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 and celebration. celebration, celebration of, um, uh, of birthdays, anniversaries, achievements. I did a funeral. I officiated a funeral yesterday for a a retired employee that was at the sheriff's office. His wife just passed away. And so as I'm talking in the the, the funeral, I'm letting him know, listen, when you share your, when you share stories, when you laugh, when you cry, it's all about healing. That's all part of the process. The more you keep it down and don't talk about it, healing takes longer. It's all about these experiences, these achievements. People celebrate some weird, strange things. So I don't know if you remember when you were a young person, middle school, high school. Today is our three-month anniversary of when you first sent a heart text to me. What? You're celebrating that? And then the guy gets in trouble because he doesn't even know that. Or how about some of the men in here? I mean, I, I, women care about this stuff too, but I, it feels like men care about this more. When you roll over in your car to 100,000 miles, 200,000 miles. Do you, do you remember that day? I remember my matrix. I hit 200,000 miles. I am on my way to work, and I see I have like one-tenth a mile. You know, it's 0. .9, and it's like one nine 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 nine. I'm like... I can't park right now. I'm driving around in the parking lot laughing, knowing my clerks who are in the building watching all the cameras, look at the chaplain. What is he doing? I'm driving around, and when it was so close, I take my phone out, and I start recording a video of it switching. Nobody cared. 
My brother gave me a thumbs up. Nobody else in my family cared. I cared. It's a milestone, you know, 200,000 miles. That's, you know, I got rid of it a week later, but still. So today's title, as you see on the screen, is Celebrating or Celebrate Accomplishments. Celebrate accomplishments. All types of accomplishments out there. Uh, When I first started putting this stuff together, I immediately thought about when my three kids were babies. I remember, I don't know if you you did this when your kids were were young. Um, There are websites. There's so many different websites. There are websites you can go to, parent websites, and it'll tell you if your kid is on track. Does that that make sense? So at two months, they should be doing this. At four months, at six months, at 18 months, one year, two year, three year, all the way to five years old, it'll tell you how they're supposed to be speaking, how they're supposed to be uh, maneuvering, their, their mechanics, everything like that. It's, it's, it's all right there. It tells you how to do things. Uh, not how to do things, but it, as far as what to expect. What milestones should your child be at at this moment? And it's a big deal, especially for a first-time parent. It's a big deal. I remember when we got the, the kids weighed, and you get that. I don't know why this is a big deal. They measured the, the head. I, I don't. My head, my child's head is in the 80th percentile. What do you do about that? I don't know. So, so this website I found, it was given social and emotional um, Language, uh, communication, cognitive, which means, you know, the learning, the thinking, the problem solving, movement, physical development. So I just want to give you a few of these just to just kind of get, uh, give you an idea of what's happening. So in two months, the social and emotional behavior, the child begins to smile. You remember when a little baby first starts starting to smile? Oh, it's just the, I mean, you want to talk about brighten up your day. When, that, when you walk in and they see they see you, and the huge smile comes on their face like, I know you. You feed me. Right? Uh, the language communication, there's a lot of coos, you know, uh, uh, makes gurgling sounds, turns head towards sounds. I know that was a big one for me. I was so nervous when the, my, my first, my, when Lexi, when she was first born, they were doing the hearing test. Okay, I'm a, I'm a musician. I play instruments. I love to sing. I love music. I was more, had more anxiety about my kids knowing how to hear than anything else. I wanted them to love music. No one plays an instrument yet, but that's okay. Uh, but they, they start turning their head with sounds. Cognitively, they start learning. They start paying attention to faces. They begin to follow things with their eyes. That's fun. That's fun to do. Uh, movement, uh, physical development, they can hold their head up about two months or so pretty consistently and begins to push up when lying on their stomach. Tummy time, right? And you get about 30 seconds of that before they start flipping out. At 12 months, their social and emotional is, is they're, they're shy and nervous with strangers. They repeat sounds or actions. Now that just begins at 12 months. That doesn't stop until they're More irritating than ever. Um, They start playing games. Peekaboo, you know, patty cake. We used to love that one. Uh, Language communication. They start shaking their head no or waving bye. Remember that one? Gosh, it's so cute when kids do that. Uh, Cognitively, they explore things in different ways. They shake stuff, bang stuff, stick everything in their mouth. Um, They start copying gestures. That's when it starts. It doesn't end until later on. Uh, movement physical, they start pulling themselves up to stand, maybe walking on the, next to the couch, you know, all that's taking place. At five years, their social and emotional skills, they want, they want to please and be like friends. They start noticing things that I want to please my friends. That's at five years old. Now, I, I highlighted this part because it, this is a rarity in this day and age. At five years old, a child starts learning genders. Our government doesn't know that. But a five-year-old knows the difference between a boy and a girl. I'm going to hang out there for a second. You wonder why the Bible says you're supposed to come to God with childlike faith. They see a, a girl and it's like, hey, that's a girl. They see a boy, hey, that's a boy. 
But later on, well, we'll see. I actually just heard, saw an article, my wife just showed me uh, a video, where I, I forget what state, I don't think it's as relevant. I think I remember the state, but I, I want to, it doesn't matter. But one of the teach or one of the parents were complaining to the school board because they heard that a child considers themselves a cat. This ain't SNL. So they consider themselves to be a cat. The school board okayed it to put kitty litter in the bathroom for the child. A five-year-old knows the difference between a boy and a girl. Maybe the wrong person's running this school board. It wasn't local, that's for sure. We need to pray for our school, man. Um, Movement uh, and, and physical development, it can use toilets on their own at five years old. Jesus. I remember the first moment we were diaper free in our house. I mean, all three kids, all of them are grown. We're on the last one, and finally, we didn't buy diapers. I was like, wait, what? We've been buying diapers for 10 years. This is the first time in history we are diaper-free. It's a great moment. There's things you should celebrate, and that's one of them. Although I'm not going to go in detail here, there's stuff, there's, there's milestones in teenager years, voice, voice change, puberty, facial hair, driver's license, first job, graduation, 18 years old. I was so excited to turn 18 because I could vote. And I turned 18 in July. That next November was the presidential election. I was able to vote. I walked around my school with I voted on. Oh, man, I was so proud. It was an exciting moment. As an adult, we still have milestones, right? Graduating, a degree, marriage maybe, maybe starting your career. You finally bought a home. You know the three M's of adulthood, right? Marriage, mortgage, and minivan. That's right. That's right. That's right right there. I remember when I turned 25, I was excited about that because I could finally do what? rent a car. I didn't rent a car at that time, but the fact that I could, it made me feel better. At 30, I was excited because I was no longer in my 20s. Look, in the business world, if you're in, the tw- if you're in your 20s, it's very difficult to put your, get your foot out there and be respected in, if you're in the 20s. For some reason, when you hurt, turn 30, there's something about turning 30, you're no longer in your 20s. Sorry, teenagers, when you turn 20, it's still... It's like you're not a real adult or something. I don't know. I remember being excited when I turned 35. Why? I could run for president. I'm not running for president. It's just the fact that I could. At 35, we can uh, run for president. But there's other milestones. Starting your business, becoming a CEO, retirement. Some fun stuff right there. But milestone, goals, accomplishments, man, these are, these are stuff, some fun stuff to celebrate. Today, we're going to look at uh, two accomplishments, two, um, two celebrations, one in the Old Testament and one in the New. Okay, you'll, you'll see on the screen, I have 2 Samuel chapter 6, if you want to get that ready, and Mark chapter 12. We're going to deal with 2 Samuel 6 first, so, so grab Mark 12 and put a, put a finger in there or, or, or get it ready to go. So 2 Samuel chapter 6, as you're turning there, I just want to kind of give you a heads up what's happening. David has, been just, has just become king. Not just of king of Judah, but of all of Israel. So today's setup, if you will, in the previous chapter, we're not going to read it, but in the previous chapter, we find David going to war against the Jebusites. See, the Jebusites at this point of history are the rulers of Zion, of Jerusalem. They rule it. And David takes his men, conquers the city, and renames it to the city of David. He expands it. He fortifies it. Uh, uh, The Temple of David is built during this time, and he wants to move. This is a brilliant strategy. So he's the the king of basically a southern kingdom, which 
southern and northern kingdom haven't split yet, but basically the southern kingdom of Judah, and there's a king of Israel up, up north. So at this point, he, he, he makes the capital of Hebron in the south. When he conquers Jerusalem and becomes king over everything, he doesn't stay at Hebron. He brilliantly moves about 18 miles north to the city of David and makes that the new capital of all of Israel. It's a brilliant strategy. So, so in Judah, he actually ruled over Judah in, in Hebron for seven and a half years. And then in Jerusalem, again, about 18 miles north, he ruled there for 33 years. So he ruled for 40 and a half years. He was the king. So here we are on the way to the city. This is the previous chapter, chapter 5. David is bringing the ark of the Lord. We talked about this a number of weeks ago. I don't know if you remember this story. He's bringing the ark of the Lord from Hebron to Jerusalem. So the ark where they were, where they, where they hear from God, um, where where Moses built and, and it led them at night with, with fire, by fire, and during the day with smoke. I mean, this is the ark of God. Doc, uh, David is taking it from where it was, from where it used to be, to where they are currently located. Does that make sense? It used to be in Hebron. They're moving it to Jerusalem. The old place, now the new, cha- new capital. That makes sense, right? But if you, rem- if you remember... This is where the ox stumbled. Remember that? And Usa reached out to protect it. Remember that sermon? Please say yes, because I preached it. So he reached out to protect it to make sure it didn't fall, and what had happened? God was furious and killed him on the spot. And not just because of that, because there was no reverence for God. Not only that, they weren't even carrying the Ark of the Covenant correctly. They were carrying it on a trailer. They hooked it up to a Ford. The Ford blew a tire, and someone grabbed the Ark. So the ox stumbled. Usa kind of protected it. He's killed. So instead of bringing to Jerusalem, look, I don't know if you've ever had a party and you had a party killer. That's a, that's a mood killer right there. When someone dies at the party, just call it off. End the party. All right, so he stops the parade. He takes the the ark, and he puts it in Obed-Edom's house. Remember that story? So here we are. This is chapter 6 now, and I'm going to read starting in verse number 11. The ark of the Lord remained there in Obed-Edom's house for three months, and the Lord blessed Edom, Obed-Edom, there we go, and his entire household. So let me just pause there and just kind of, I'm going to deal with blessed Obed-Edom. Now, you don't have to turn there, but in 2 Chronicles chapter 26, we read that Obed-Edom was richly blessed. Not only was he richly blessed, he had eight sons because of it. Eight. Those sons had kids, and total, they had 62 strong male heirs. This was a blessed family. It may have seemed like he had a small part in this big story, but because of his honoring and reverence towards God, what a great example to live our lives to honor and respect and show reverence to our God. The same one. All right, verse number 12. Then King David was told, the Lord has blessed Obed-Edom's household and everything he has because of the ark of God. I wonder... I wonder if David was walking around the Jerusalem one day and he thought to himself, wait a minute, where's the Ark of the Lord? Oh my gosh, I left it with Obed-Edom. There's probably a crater there of where their house used to be, right? Like the last thing he heard about the Ark of the Covenant was God was mad and he killed the person that that was dealing with it. I wonder if he thought, oh my gosh, Obed-Edom, there's a... A meteor hit it. He's gone. And then he finds out, oh, no, God's blessed him so much so. Well, you know, I had a great idea. Let's bring it back here. And so he goes, and he brings it back, but he does it properly this time. So where are we at? We have 12 or 13. All right, verse 13. After the men who were carrying the ark of the Lord. Now, look, you hear that? Do you see that? 
after the men who were carrying the ark of the Lord. That's the way you're supposed to carry it. On the shoulders with two poles going through. You carry it. So after the men who were carrying the ark of the Lord had gone six steps, David did what? He sacrificed a bull and fattened calf. And David, verse number 14, and David danced before the Lord with all his might, wearing a priestly garment. So David and all the people of Israel brought up, brought up the ark of the Lord with shouts of joy and blowing the ram's horns. Look, this is a celebration, a big time celebration. What were they celebrating? They were celebrating the return of God. They were celebrating quite essence is, is the word of God. They heard from God from the mercy seat in be, right, right in the center of the two cherubims. That's where they heard from God. God is now back in the central part of where they live, the heartbeat of the country. So I just need you to picture this. You are on a long trip, vacation, business, whatever the case may be. You're exhausted. You're, you're, you're tired of hotel rooms. You're tired of their beds, their chairs, their continental breakfast. You're sick of all this stuff. You're exhausted. You're tired. And all you're thinking is, I just want to be home. I want, I want my pillow. I want my bed. I want my, my bathroom and my kitchen and my living room. I miss that. I finally pull in the house. Although I'm exhausted, I'm celebrating on the inside. Been traveling all night. I start creating this trail. You ever done this? This trail. You're like, it, it's as if Hansel and Gretel were at your house. Right? And you're leaving breadcrumbs of where you need to, where you've been. So at the front door, you see your suitcase. You don't care about your suitcase. Right? From there, you, you throw your shirt as you're walking, you throw it on the couch. At that moment, you, you go a little bit farther, you take your, your pants, right? And you put your pants on the. Kevin, where do you put your pants? Pants on the. Ground. You put your pants on the ground, pants on the ground, looking like a fool with your pants on the ground. Look, it's not funny if I have to explain stuff, okay? <laughs> Stay with me. Thank, thank you for being here. Thank you for being here. Pastor Kevin and I, we're... Okay. So last couple of steps before hitting the bed, what we do. So we got our shirt off, our, our, our bag's over there, our shirt's over here, our pants are over here. Finally, we get to the socks, and what we do? We don't bend over. We're too lazy for that. We put one foot on top of the sock and rip that thing out. Right? You take the next step, you put that there, and you rip that out. Anybody else? Right? Okay. I'm not doing this. Are you crazy? Sometimes we just do this and... Wherever it lands, it just lands. So you lie on your bed, and your pillow catches your head and escorts it perfectly to a perfect position for a night of rest. Are you, are you with me? It just smells different. It feels different. I'm home. There's no place like home, right? This is David. This is Israel. The ark, their, their monument, their flag, is finally where it belongs. It's home. Is that, is that, are you seeing that? So not only did they celebrate, they sacrificed. They cheered. They, they, they rocked out, if you will. They celebrated. But they would do anything for love. They would do anything for their God. They would do anything to make sure they get it right. They wanted to bring God back home. They would do anything for love. And God is love. What a scene. The, speaking of rest and, 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 and celebrating, I heard about this guy who had a, had a big garden. This garden went around the house. One day a strange dog, if you had one of these deals, had a strange dog come to his garden. The dog looks at the man and then lies down next to him. When the man stands up and walks to the house, the dog walks behind him into the house. When they're inside, the dog jumps on the sofa, closes his eyes, and sleeps for one hour. He wakes up, walks to the door. The man lets the dog out. The next day, the dog comes again, jumps on the sofa, and sleeps for an hour. This happens for three weeks in a row. 
The man finally wants to know what's going on with this strange dog coming to his house every day. So he writes on a piece of paper, every afternoon, your dog comes to my house and sleeps for one hour on my sofa. The man takes a piece of paper, puts it in the dog's collar. The next day, the dog comes with a different piece of paper in his collar. It says, he lives in a home with four loud children. He needs a quiet place to relax. Can I come with him tomorrow? <laughs> rest, relaxing, that's worth celebrating. A good night of rest. It's, it's, it's a good one. Uh, I, I swear by cat naps. I am, I am a, I'm a 20-minute napper. I get home on Wednesday night. Wednesday nights are my really long nights. I wake up at 3.30 in the morning. I work all day. I come home. I take a 20-minute nap. I get up. I'm like, all right, I'm ready to preach. There's something about taking the, that rest. It's really important. David, Israel finally have their new home, their forever home. They have their forever home. God is where he belongs. Now that's a cause for celebration. So let's look at one more. The New Testament, you got that ready to go? Mark chapter 12? I try to give you plenty of time to find Mark because that's a tough one to find. All right, so Mark chapter 12, we find Jesus in Jerusalem walking in the temple. The leaders at this point in time send some Pharisees to try to throw him a curveball. They try to trap him. They do that from time to time. I don't know if you have anybody in your life that does that to you. They'll try to trap you with some questions. They do that with this one. It's actually in this conversation where, where they ask, should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? Remember that conversation? Then later it says, you know, if a, if a man dies, the woman is a widow. They have no kids. So according to our law, the brother is to marry so the heir can go on, right? If you remember the this, this story, that brother dies, she gets married again. The next brother dies, gets married again. That brother dies. Listen, if you're the brother, check the life insurance. That's all I'm saying. Check the life insurance. So she marries all seven brothers. This is the trapping question that they ask. All seven brothers marry and die before kids. Who's Whose wife is she going to be in heaven? See the trapment? So that's this situation. So after that conversation, Jesus is watching all these Pharisees and Sadducees parading around the temple. I don't know if that irritates you. Shoulders are back. Heads up. Nose is going. They're probably not even walking right. You know, this is walking. They're probably doing the whole... Right? Because they're religious, you know? They love the attention. Can you see Jesus? He looks around the rest of the people. He's watching all this happen. He's looking around like, these guys are looking at these sneaking Pharisees and Sadducees like they're something. Like, I, I don't know if you can picture it. Have you ever looked at somebody else? Have you ever looked at your, your idol, the person you look up to, but you don't, you don't really want to know them because it's like a disappointment almost, you know? But you look at this artist, this, this, this teacher, they're amazing, this athlete. Oh, my gosh, they're finally here. Then you meet him like, dude, you're a jerk. But when you see him from a distance, it's like they got this bling on, they got the, 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 the necklaces and the jewelry, and it's, it's impressive. And so these guys are like, wow. And Jesus is looking at him like, oh, my gosh. They're falling for this? So when Jesus says to the people, you guys ready? I kind of set it up long enough, right? So Mark chapter 12, verse number 38 says this. Jesus also taught, beware of these teachers of religious law. Can you see them gathering together? Guys, look. See those punks over there? I know they look pro professional. I know they look religious. I'm telling you, don't follow their example. Can you see him doing that? Beware of these teachers of religious law, for they like to parade around in flowing robes and receive respectful greetings as they walk into the marketplace. There are religions out there when the leader, the spiritual leader walks in, you genuflect. Oh, you're, you're in the room. 
Are you serious? Who are you worshiping? So verse number, uh, we have 39? Yeah, verse number 39. And how they love the seats of honor in the synagogues and the head table at banquets. Look, that's important. There's one time I was uh, doing the radios with the, the Lee County Sheriff's Office, and I was invited to go to the major's office. We we're in the process of doing the radio stuff, and I knew there's quite a few people going to be there. I'm looking at the table, and there's like four chairs. Guess where I sat? Way over here in this chair that was in the corner. It's like, I'm not sitting there. Are you serious? Because I knew major, colonel, uh, my supervisor, the director, all of them were going to be in the meeting. Why am I going to be at your table? I'll be over here. If you need me, throw me a bone. I'm not going to sit up there. Are you serious? I wasn't nervous to talk to these people, let alone anything else. There's off with their head kind of a situation. So verse number 40, yet they, were shamelessly, uh, yet they shamelessly cheat widows out of their property and then pretend to be pious. They pretend to be religious by making long prayers in public because of this they will be more severely punished. Look, if you want a leadership position, y'all need to grab a hold of some of these verses. Jesus sat down near the collection box in the temple and watched as the crowds dropped in their money. Many rich people put in large amounts. Look, it's impressive when you take a wad of cash and throw it in the offering in front of people. Whoa, what did you do this week? 42. Then a poor widow came and dropped in what? Two small coins. When you research these two coins, it's the lowest amounts possible in their currency. It was two pennies. They dropped two small coins. Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I tell you the truth. This poor woman has given more than all the others who are making contributions. But they gave a tiny part of their surplus, but she, poor as she is, has given everything she has to live on. Look, it's not about the finances. It's not about, it's not about giving X amount of cash. It's not about giving checks. It's not about that. It's about giving your best. That's what God wants. God, listen, God doesn't need your money. He just wants your best. He wants your best. So can you see the celebration part here? Can you see the celebration accomplishments here? You see, Jesus doesn't celebrate the same things we do. The people that looked the part were in the room. These are the crowd that, you know, I'm sexy and I know it crowd, right? They speak, to the, ling they speak the lingo. They have the Christian t-shirts. They know when to say amen. They know the proper verse to use at any moment. They know how and when to raise their hands in church. You know why I know that? It's because they were Pharisees and Sadducees. They memorized the Torah. How much have you memorized? These are spiritual leaders. In a debate, they would make you look silly. They'd make me look silly. They know when to say They know how to raise their hands, and when to, when to do that. They know it. They know how and when to kneel, bow. They know when to say amen. You met people like that? They cry when they need to cry because of the people are watching. I always felt bad for my kids. You know, I work at the jail, and I, I deal with inmates all the time. And I have inmates that we talk to that can cry like that. I see it so much, it means nothing to me. And I'm like, mm, yes. Mm. And then they start asking for favors. I know what they're doing. It's called emotional manipulation. I feel bad for my kids because my kids drive sometimes. You done crying? Does that, like, work and all? Because it ain't working with me. So when you're done, just let me know. We can talk. You, you, with me? you with me? Like, I feel bad for my kids, but it means nothing to me if you cry. Like, okay, well, I'll just let you finish. 
So they know how to do church. I don't know if you met them. Then Jesus pulls his disciples over. Guys, don't be like them. When you worship and lift your hands, you do it for him. Do it for me. Don't for anybody else. Not for glory, nothing like that. You do it for me. Don't be like them. When they made the offering a spectacle, do it with reverence and humility. I've seen people take offerings, and before we actually give the offering, they have it in their hand. They're waving it. Got it. You got an offering. Breathe. Breathe. Don't let your right hand know what your left hand's doing. It's the people that walk into a building and they expect the red carpet. Where's the paparazzi? I'm in the room. But look at that one over there, he says. Look at that old lady. Just don't, don't, don't look at anything else. Watch this lady walk up. She's slowly walking up. Her shoulder, you know, she knows she's not going to give a lot. Not compared to anybody else. And she drops these two pennies. And he says, that right there is more than anybody else. That's celebrating. He celebrates differently, doesn't he? Which is a huge accomplishment, and it's worthy of celebrating. All right, so what's the deal now? How are we going to land this plane? The uh, so what, now what, if you will, what do we do with all these two, these, these two stories? David and Israel celebrating the return of the ark of the, uh, of the Lord. or are celebrating this. We finally have this back. And this poor old woman giving pennies on the dollar, giving all that she has. Perhaps there is someone here, or maybe listening online, maybe there's someone here that you have a good home. Things seem seem to be pretty solid. They're going well. But maybe, just maybe, you have God, you have Christ, you have your relationship with him Someone that has been a part of my life for years and years and years, but because of a move, but because of a change in my life, because a change of a job, a change of home, a change of relationship, maybe a change of my own age. I was 12 and I worshiped God, but now I'm 18. I'm 30. And the God that was always a part of who we are, always led where we were going is no longer the center of our life. Maybe someone here left God in the old place. Back there. At, it's time to bring where? God back home. Because God is not a part of a, a specific building. It has nothing to do with this building how God moves. It's about what you give here. It's time to bring, bring God home and celebrate like David did. Maybe there's someone here who feels like they have nothing to give, especially compared to, to Ron or Linda or Bob. I can't give like they give. I don't have the talents they give. Maybe, maybe you don't have the talents. Maybe, maybe you feel like that because you don't have the clothes like other people wear. Maybe it's because of your car. Maybe because of your st- uh, society, your status in society. Maybe it's because of your career. I can't do anything. I'm just a bus driver. I work at Walmart. I'm retired. But I realize I, I choose to celebrate nonetheless. No matter what trial I face, no matter where I lay my head, I will give my all. I will give my best. Even though I don't have accolades, even though I don't have the camera on me, nothing of that is happening. I'm going to give my best. Maybe that's you in here. Perhaps there is someone here who knows all the answers. They're basically a theologian who knows what to say and when to say it, who loves being admired and praised and lifted up. Maybe someone in here looks down at others because their talents easily is more beneficial than anyone else's. Let me ask you this. Is God where he belongs in my life? 
Have I left him? Have I left my relationship in some place where I used to be? Is God where he belongs? Let's bring him back home, amen? To celebrate the most important accomplishment we can do. Now that's a cause for celebration. To celebrate him because of who he is. Not because of my talents, my abilities, my paycheck, but because of who he is. Let's give our best, not just financially, let's give our best talents, our abilities, whatever it is, as small an amount you think it is, give it your all. I give my all. Everything I do. Amen. We stand to your feet. I want to challenge you in this moment. Before we start singing this song, if you will agree with me by a raise of hand, I don't know if if you had a relationship with God. and you, It's not that you don't anymore, but you know you had a trial. You had a moment where in the past you served God 100%. But something happened. There was a change that took place, and he's no longer present in your current situation. Bring him home. Are you ready to bring him home? Let's pray. God, I pray for each person in here. Lord, that we would bring you back home to us. That we served you once upon a time ago. We know all the right things to say. We remember everything. But we haven't brought you to our new location where we are spiritually, emotionally, physically, Welcome home, Lord.